on our recent visit to Dolby Laboratories in Mumbai, our lead audio reviewer, Driti Datta, got into a conversation with marketing head, Samir Seth. If you'd like to see that video, click on the link above. She also had a one-on-one -on -one with Jayan Shah, the director of Absent Solutions Engineering in Emerging Markets at Dolby Laboratories. Hello, and thank you so much for giving us your time. Firstly, what we would like to know is what kind of certifications uh, do smartphone OEMs have to go through to have their uh, content Dolby Atmos certified? Yeah, so, so, their devices. Yeah, so once uh, an OEM signs uh, the license, <clears throat> they get access to, uh, to our kit, which right. is, uh, you know, the software and a bunch of documentation how to implement it. Uh, and once they have that access, they do the implementations. Part of the documentation is the whole test procedure. There's okay. a test kit along with it. Okay. They go through that test. Now there are there are different levels. I mean, if, if it's a new first time implementer, then uh, you know they have the option to send a sample to us, okay. uh, to our test, to our labs, uh, our test centers. We have labs uh, in, in China, we have them in the US and various places. So, uh, we do the test and uh, we give them a test report, telling them, you know, things are hopefully if they've all passed and then they're, they're good to go. Okay. If uh, things are not working the way they should be working, uh, then we send them a correction list saying, you know, you need to fix this and we can help you. Uh, the guys who are more seasoned or, or you know, older Dolby licensees, they already know how to test. So, so we are fine with them doing self-tests. Okay. They do self test. They send us the test reports. We look at the report, and based on that, we issue a, you know a, a clearance. Um, you know there are, there are levels of clearances, but yeah, once once they've cleared the tests, yes, every device or every new model that comes out is has to go through the testing and certification. So we've seen uh, some smartphones as low as fifteen thousand or even ten thousand have Dolby Atmos. How yeah. do you fit the uh, technology or the algorithms into such a small form factor? like tablets and smartphones. What, what is the process behind this and can you let us know about it? Okay, so at a hardware level, we integrate with the chipset. Right. Um, so the, the uh, you know, the, the coding, the, the decoders, all the magic is inside the chipset. Right. Um, in terms of form factors, you know, we don't want to, we want to democratize this because, you know, there's no sort of restriction or thing. Uh, only the, really high-end phones, it's in our interest to, to go as, as broad-based as possible. So we don't limit uh, the hardware. I mean, obviously there's a, there's a minimum spec. Like I, I, I was discussing with you earlier, yeah. which was, you know, you need at least two speakers. Two speakers, right? yes. So, so if you don't have two speakers, there's really no point. It's difficult. Exactly. So, so, you know, there are some minimum specifications that are required. But beyond that, we don't restrict. And and then again, you know, there, there, there is the physics of uh, hardware. Right. So, so, so the physics will limit you up to a point. Mm -hmm. Our intent is to get the best out of that hardware, whatever is available. Okay. Certainly, we have discussions with OEMs, and we, if we find something that doesn't really work, mm -hmm. we can give them suggestions. Okay. There are some OEMs that come to us at the design stage, right in the beginning, uh, which becomes easier because then we help them with the acoustic design, even of, of the case, you know, sometimes, okay. and the selection of drivers. That kind of stuff. Okay. So obviously, you know, we don't want to restrict the hardware right. uh, beyond the minimum requirement. Um, we are okay to, to, you know, do the best possible. Can you yeah. let us know what, us what some of these minimum specs and requirements are? <laughs> There's, yeah, I would maybe imagine. through a price range or even the highest end. Again, you know, range. price is not uh, really the criteria, and there are there are televisions uh, doing Dolby Vision or Dolby Atmos as low as fifteen thousand rupees. Okay. Uh, you know, so and and then there's, there's the really high end stuff right. uh, which goes into lags. Right. So so there's, I don't think price is really a defining thing anymore. Uh, that you know that perception of premium, you know, dollars only there and premium, uh, that's that's gone. Uh, I mean, maybe the perception hasn't gone, but the reality is that they have it in, in okay. pretty much every model. So I, I don't think price is really the criteria. In in, in phones, if you look at phones, we are. Hundred dollars upwards, maybe okay. some even eighty dollar phones probably have it. Okay. I, mean, I, I really uh, there are too many models to keep track of everything. Okay. Uh, but yeah, if I if I take the database, like I said, we test everything, so I could probably tell you a given model 
So from what I know, there are three codecs used in Dolby Atmos, which is Dolby Digital Plus, Dolby True HD, and Dolby MEP or MAD. Yeah. Can you explain, uh, go into detail about these codecs and explain it to our viewers? Okay. Um, so Dolby Digital Plus essentially is a lossy uh, high compression codec, okay. and uh, initially it came about. So Dolby Digital is the one everyone's familiar with, uh, which which is now pretty old, uh, and uh, that had bitrate limitations. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a certain limit to compression that we could apply using that, and when. Uh, when you went into OTT, the demand for, or when video compression actually got better and better, you know, they started demanding better compression for audio. Right. And Dolby Digital was intrinsically invented for cinema. Okay. And, and when it served the purpose of cinema, we stopped, you know, innovating. Good. And then the same thing was adapted for, for broadcast pretty much in the okay. early days and DVD. Uh, Dolby Digital Plus uh, came about from the streaming. You so know, it was born there. It was born there pretty okay. much. And then, then we, uh, so it has better compression. Okay. Uh, it has uh, theoretically a more a larger channel capacity. So mm -hmm. Dolby Digital limited to 5.1. Okay. Then it went to, in theory, Dolby Digital Plus can do 13.1, mm -hmm. but I don't think anyone ever found that far. So 7.1 Yeah. Uh, so, so Dolby Digital Plus, we adapted it because it was pretty much universally. Uh, uh, you know, in many, many devices. Mm -hmm. So when we launched Atmos, we had to figure out a way of keeping it compatible okay. uh, because of the huge device deployment. Mm -hmm. So we uh, sort of retrofitted Atmos into it, a little bit of clever engineering. Okay. And uh, the same codec can carry Atmos, okay. uh, but it is in a sense a compressed lossy codec for streaming and broadcast. True HD and, and MAT, on the other hand, are very, very high quality. Uh, they, True HD is lost us completely. There's no, no glossy compression. Okay. Uh, it, again, True HD came out with, with Blu-ray, pretty much. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the default lossless codec on many Blu-rays. Mm -hmm. Not all, but, but many. Um, and uh, MAT then became a transport mechanism to go from what we call a source device to a seat device, which means a, 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 a set-top box connected to a TV, for example. Okay. Okay. So you can decode Atmos in a set-top box and then over HDMI, because HDMI actually 2.x mm -hmm. will allow you to stream uncompressed audio. Okay. So you can, if your TV doesn't have a decoder, you can actually decode Atmos into uh, PCM, into uncompressed audio and then transport it with metadata using a technology like MAC. So MAC was designed to allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, how the set-top box knows what the TV can render or what the downstream device is basically using EDID and various signaling techniques which which tell the set-top box what the capability of the downstream device is and then it will do the render according to that. Okay. And MAT allows you to move PCM audio into that device and then use uh, metadata which is the object metadata which I was telling you about, you know, the positioning right. of the yes. object. So we can transport that uh, across to the... Right. Speaking of that, I think we were talking about it earlier before this interview as well. How is the uh, rendering happening on your end from AI or algorithms uh, so that it knows what device it's playing on and adjusts accordingly? Okay, yeah. So, so in channel-based traditional mixing, mm -hmm. stereo for example, or 5.1, uh, you so the mix engineer basically does the render. He assigns sounds to specific speakers, mm -hmm. channels, right? Okay. So if you do a 5.1 mix, you could down mix it, uh, you know. But but even the down mix is sort of rigid, you know. It, it follows a certain set of rules. You can down mix 5.1 to say stereo, okay. period. That's it, or mono. But you can't go beyond, you know. You can't do fancy speaker configurations like three speakers or four mm -hmm. speakers or something like that. In, in an object-based sound format like Atmos, this assignment of sound to speaker doesn't happen. What happens is that the mix engineer is basically working with a bed and a bunch of objects. So, so there are certain static sounds which he assigns. He has a certain speaker configuration which he's monitoring on. And then he just assigns sounds to locations in the room in a 3D space. 
So he can place a sound above his head to the left of this behind him mm -hmm. using a joystick kind of a mechanism. Uh, there's a visual display on the console which shows you where the sound is physically placed. There's a visual representation. So how big that sound is, how loud it is, and and where it is is all that you need. Okay. okay? And the sound is just recorded as sound. There's there's no allocation to any speaker. Okay. What you record is the sound and its location in in coordinates. Right. Right. Yes. That is transmitted. The basic sound is transmitted and its location and its movement in relation to time. Mm -hmm. So so it's recorded every frame. Right. right. So 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 obviously you can move sound. So the location will change. Mm -hmm. So that is transmitted as metadata, and then at the consumer end, the consumer may have different speaker configurations. So it may be two speakers, it may be a sound bar, it could be a TV, it could be a full size home theater with okay. with ceiling speakers. Okay. So the sound system at home knows the speaker configuration and therefore knows how best to render those coordinates, and then it it does the rendering at the consumer home. So it, in effect, it becomes independent of the speakers. So that's that's the beauty of of, of, of an immersive system like that. So as someone who enjoys sound and music and who's just a wizard when it comes to that, uh, what is something that you hold near and dear? What do you think is the pedestal that uh, good sound and good visuals have to reach when you're buying a device? So, yeah, as a, as a, as a tech guy, you know, yeah. the first thing I'd look at is probably the response of the system, as in. I know people can go completely crazy, you know, looking at specification sheets. At least engineers can. Uh, and uh, but I would look for the low frequency response, which is where a lot of systems fail. Um, yes. And and the high people are obsessed with this, you know, twenty kilohertz thing. Um, honestly, there is no sound above twelve, thirteen, maybe. Yeah. People will shoot me down for this. There are, there are purists who say, you know, 15k, 18k. I can hear 18k. I can't personally. So, so yeah. So the high frequencies should be good, nice and clear. But I don't particularly go for speakers that are. Although I don't get obsessed with the high that much. But low frequencies, yes. I mean, I I like the lows to be nice and tight and you know, right there. And it's it's harder to to get low frequencies done right. Uh, you cannot do low frequencies with small loopers. Again, you know you can you can play with it. You can design resonant enclosures, do things like that. But if you don't have a nice big diaphragm to push the air, mm -hmm. you're not going to get. Really good so you think form uh, form factors like TWS don't really do the low do, they do for sure. I mean, there's some very clever uh, engineering that goes into resonant enclosures, yeah. uh, which works very well. Um, I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is that that is really no substitute for a good driver. If you yeah. have a decent driver, yeah. particularly in low frequency. Yeah. In the highs, yeah, sure. I mean, people tend to overemphasize the highs, even even mixes. Yeah. I've seen people pumping it up too much, and it becomes sibilant. Yes, but that's not something I like. The SMT sounds. Yeah, so correct. So, so you get a lot of that. So so yeah. So I mean, this is sounding very abstract, but I go for things like that. I look at it. The other thing is, don't buy a speaker system or any music system without listening to it, mm -hmm. and don't buy without listening to your music. Do not listen to the demo that the guy is playing. Mm -hmm. I I just played you a lot of demos, so I should <laughs> probably should. But I'm just saying that don't listen to demo equipment or demo tracks because they're designed to enhance, you know, or or to show off the best features. Listen to stuff that you listen to that you're intimately familiar with. Mm -hmm. That will give you a very good idea of. You know how it should sound, how you want it to sound. I think that's that's really my you know that's the holy grail. Don't look at the spec sheet if you don't want to, but listen to it. That's very important. I think we should let you yeah. leave now. Otherwise, my flight is Thank you so much. Do an outro, like uh, say thank you. No, no, no.